Okay, you ready? Ready? Okay. Okay. So, three chances for entropy. 100 years of entropy as heat. Prologue. Once upon a time, an American cartoonist drew two professors at a cocktail party. In my opinion, Mrs. Wendell, and I believe Dr. Steinmuth will concur, if you can live with entropy, you can live with anything. So which one of you agrees? <laughs> the majority of physics teachers believe that entropy is difficult to teach. And maybe most of you believe that the concept of entropy is anyway one of the most occult concepts in physics. But 100 years ago, a physicist named Kalendar worked out how entropy can be introduced in a way every schoolboy could understand. Here, the American cartoonist, their Kalendar. Do they speak of the same thing? Well, we hope to show you that Cal Kalendar's idea was a mischance for physics education. We will argue that entropy, which was introduced by the physicist Clausius, can be visualized as a fluid light uh, substance, and that entropy and layman's heat are just two different names for the same physical quantity. This idea is not new. There were three chances for entropy to be introduced in this way. So we will start by going back to the mist of time, to the middle of the 18th century. First chance. Hello friends. Please let me introduce myself. I'm Joseph Black. I was born in 1728 in France, but I am Scottish by blood. People will later say that I died in 1799. Sorry, I must believe that I cannot check on that. I am a professor of chemistry and medicine at the University of Edinburgh. One of my former students and current collaborators is James Watt. He attended my courses when I was in Glasgow University and repaired the <coughs> university's engine. He's a fine man and a fine engineer. Maybe people will remember him while they forget my name and what I have done. But I have made many contributions to science. For my 1754 thesis to become a doctor of medicine, I discovered a kind of air that could be fixed by a solid and released by heating and also through chemical reactions. I call it fixed air. Today we call it carbon dioxide. Fixed air was a very new idea. Since at that time many people thought that all gases were the same air and that gases could not combine with solids. My work Laid to the foundation for the pneumatic chemistry of Priestley and Cavendish, leading to the revolution of chemistry by Lavoisier. I was also the first to establish the improvement theory of heat. Yes, Professor, that's what we're here to talk about today. Can you tell us more about your theory of heat? Yes. First, I differentiated between the intensity of heat, what we call temperature, and the quantity of heat. So, if for example, we have one pound of water in a vessel and two pounds of water in another, and these two quantities of water are equally hot as examined by a thermometer, it is evident that the two pounds must contain twice the quantity of heat that is contained in one pound. Next, I identified what I called latent heat which is the great quantity of heat needed to melt ice or boil water that is not sensible by the thermometer. That is, the latent heat is absorbed and consumed without changing the temperature, yet can be seen in the fluidity it causes. The ice calorimeter provides a measure of this heat as the volume of water melted. I also introduced the idea of heat capacity based on experiment by Fahrenheit using water and quicksilver. Also called mercury. Well, he showed that quicksilver requires less heat to heat it than that which is necessary to heat by the same number of degrees 
an equal measure of equally cold water. I said that Quicksilver has less heat capacity. And I realized that equilibrium of heat will result between objects placed together in an isolated room with no fire and no sun. Heat is communicated from the hotter to the colder bodies. At equilibrium, they will all be at the same temperature, but the heat will not be equally divided or distribu distributed among them if they have different heat capacities. Wow, that's amazing. Heat versus temperature, latent heat, heat capacity, and thermal equilibrium. That's a quite a lot of innovation you did. And we still teach all of these things today. But I wonder, what do you mean by heat? Ah, good question. I can't propose with confidence any single theory of heat. But you talk about it as though heat is a substance. Well, when we perceive that what we call heat disappears in the melting of ice and reappears in the freezing of water and a number of analogous phenomena, we can hardly avoid thinking in a substance. But since heat has never been observed by us, in a separate state, all our notions of this union must be hypothetical. The French chemists call my latent heat caloric, based on the theory of Lavoisier, who invented the name. We can see on Lavoisier's table of simple substances that he includes caloric as a substance which replaces old ideas like chaleur and feu, heat and fire. In Lavoisier's scheme, the particles of an object do not touch, and the spaces among them are filled with caloric that can flow into and out of the object. The object's heat capacity depends on the size of those spaces. More importantly, caloric self, uh, is self-repulsive and attracted to matter, and since particles are thought to be attracted to each other by planets, Caloric is like an atmosphere around each particle, repelling the others. This explains why adding heat causes liquids and metals to expand, and why latent heat is needed to overcome the attractions and change the state from solid to liquid to gas. Hmm. That's an interesting theory. Uh, what do you think about the idea that heat might be motion? Yes. I'm aware of that old theory as proposed by Francis Bacon and accepted by some. But I believe that the idea is too vague and there is not enough evidence to support it as, it as a, re a replacement for the fluid model. Thank you very much, Professor Black. Black's ideas let us visualize heat as a kind of substance that can be stored in bodies and transferred between them. But uh, if we look in a modern book like Tipler's Physics for Scientists and Engineers, we find this warning. It is correct, then, to say that a system has a large amount of internal energy, but it is not correct to say that a system has a large amount of work or a large amount of heat. Heat is not something that is contained in a system. Rather, it is a measure of energy that flows from one system to another because of a difference in temperature. So what happened to black heat? Well, in Black's time, it was a general belief that if something can be seen as a kind of substance, it is automatically conserved. Creatio ex nihilo, a quasi-divine act of creation, was unthinkable at that time. For example, in 1798, uh, Count Rumford did an experiment where he bored a cannon using a blunt tool and showed that cold water could be raised to the boiling point by means of friction with no change in the original materials. Rumford concluded, anything which an insulated body or system of bodies can continue to furnish without limitation cannot possibly be a material substance. So Black's idea of a quantity of heat was questioned, and it never got the full opportunity to develop into what today we call entropy. But if we put entropy into his quote, and I'll just read the end, it is evident that the two pounds must contain twice the entropy that is contained in one pound of water. We see that it is correct. And so the first chance was lost. Second chance. Bonjour, mesdames et messieurs. 
Je m'appelle Sati Carlo. Oh, I forgot. I have to speak English. As you could guess, I am from France. My full name is Nicolas Leonard Sati Carlo. I was born in 1796, just seven years after the French Revolution started. People say I died as a young man, not older than 38 years. Good that I do not know that yet. I live in a turbulent time. My father, Lassan Nicolas Carnot, was a master military engineer, politician, and mathematician. His book on the efficiency of traditional machines was very influential for me, since I also became a military engineer. In the early <coughs> 1800s, heat engines had just come into fashion, and I was totally fascinated by them. But it seemed to me that their improvement was occurring almost by chance. So I was, I was captivated by two questions. Firstly, is there a fundamental limit for the improvement of heat engines? And secondly, are there agents preferable to steam for developing the motive power of heat? Yes, so those are the two main questions in your 1824 book. Can you give us a brief summary? Great. The main idea is that the production of motive power is due in steam engines not to an actual consumption of calorie, but to its transportation from a warm body to a cold body. But that is to its re-establishment of equilibrium. Uh, yeah, sorry, I, can you explain that in other words? I don't really understand. Uh, well, I will try to explain using the analogy of a waterfall that I use in my book. The motive power of a waterfall depends on its height and on the quantity of the liquid. The motive power of heat depends also on the quantity of caloric used and what we will call the height of its fall. That is to say, the difference of temperature of the bodies between which the, uh, the exchange of caloric is made. Sorry. This is my own invention, to visualize caloric falling from the higher to lower temperature, producing motive power. Uh, okay, so if I, if I put up some diagrams, what I think you're saying is that just like water falls from a uh, higher gravitational potential reservoir, GH2, there, to a uh, reservoir of lower gravitational potential, GH1, and produces motive power in a water wheel, caloric falls from a reservoir of higher temperature, T2, to a reservoir of lower temperature, T1, and produces motive power in a heat engine. Is that right? Yes, it's okay. Okay. And the more mass is transferred, or the greater the potential gravitational potential difference, the more motive power is produced. Similarly, the more caloric transferred, or the greater the temperature difference, the more motive power produced in a heat engine. Precisely. So this sounds like you believe in the caloric theory of heat as a substance. Uh, well, when I wrote my book, I knew that the caloric theory, theory required the most careful examination. Examinations. I tried to make my ideas independent of any one theory of heat by focusing in, on two big ideas, the idea of a heat energy cycle and the idea that the cycle is reversible, that has been perfect. Here is my diagram. Uh, okay, and I will make it a little clearer. I'll add some colors to represent hot and cold, and I'll take the four steps that you have in your diagram and spread them out. Okay, for the engine cycle, we know we can expand the body by adding heat to it independent of what it is, and we can use the expansion to produce motive power. That is the purpose of Nenji. We can then remove the heat to contract the body to its original state, ready to go again through the cycle. And this side is independent of the body, steam or otherwise. It is, it is to be a perfect reversible cycle that can be run equally, well, forwards or backwards, there can never be any direct contact between the warm and the colder body, since there can be no useless re-establishment of equilibrium, which is an actual loss. That's like a waterfall without a water wheel. Mm. Fascinating, Monsieur Pono. Merci. 
Unfortunately, Carnot died in 1832 after a series of illnesses. The second chance to view caloric as entropy was lost, perhaps due to the invention of entropy of, of energy. Peripety, a sudden change, unexpected good fortune, misfortune in a drama. It wasn't until the 1840s that the energy idea really started to become clear. Julius von Meyer was a German physician with little physical or mathematical training. The story goes that as a ship's physician on a boat to Indonesia in 1840, he realized that after a storm, the waves leave the water warmer than when the water is calm. After returning to Germany, he dedicated his life to the idea, and by 1842 published a paper that specified the warming of a given weight of water from zero to one degree Celsius corresponds to the fall of an equal weight from the height of about 365 meters. This is the first estimate of the mechanical equivalent of heat. Independently, one year later in 1843, English physicist James Joule published his first of several experiments measuring the amount of heat produced by friction. He wrote, I am satisfied that the grand agents of nature are, by the creator's fiat, indestructible, and that wherever mechanical force is expended, an exact equivalent of heat is always obtained. So based on this model, our diagram changes from this to this. In the Carnot model, uh, motive power appears as caloric falls from, uh, through a temperature difference. But in the Meyer-Joule model, motive power appears as heat disappears. These two models are difficult to reconcile. Is heat conserved, or does it appear and disappear? Well, in 1848, British physicist Lord Kelvin published his absolute thermometric scale, and uh, he based it on Carnot's theory, and he wrote, the conversion of heat or caloric into mechanical effect is probably impossible, certainly undiscovered. But in a footnote he wrote, this opinion seems to be universally held by those who have written on the subject. A contrary opinion, however, has been advocated by Mr. Jewell of Manchester. In 1849, Kelvin wrote a paper summarizing Carnot's book, and he asks, when thermal agency is spent conducting heat through a solid, what becomes of the mechanical effect which it might produce? Nothing can be lost in the operations of nature. No energy can be destroyed. And that was the first modern use of the word energy. It's also a very good question about what happens during conduction when energy is quote unquote wasted. In 1850, German physicist Rudolf Clausius did his best to integrate Joule and Carnot and wrote, it is not even requisite to cast the theory of Carnot overboard. It is quite possible that in the production of work, a certain portion of heat may be consumed and a further portion transmitted from a warm body to a cold one, and both portions stand in, def in a certain definite relation to the quantity of work produced. So now, our diagram looks like this. So, some heat is turned into work, and some heat goes from the higher to the lower temperature. By 1851, Kelvin agreed with Clausius that heat is not a substance, but a dynamical form of mechanical effect. And by 1852, he answered his own question, as it is most certain that creative power alone can either call into existence or annihilate mechanical energy, the waste cannot be annihilation, but must be some transformation of energy. And that's how it was decided. Caloric was dead, heat became energy, and both Joule and Kelvin cited the creator as the origin of energy. But something was missing. In his 1854 paper, Clausius defined the relationship between the transformation of heat into work and heat from higher temperature to lower temperature. And he said, the generation of a quantity of heat, energy, Q, of the temperature T from work has the, what he called, equivalence value Q over T. And in perfect reversible cycles that Carnot talked about, the transformations cancel each other, and that's how he ended up equaling zero. By 1864, he decided it needed its own name, and he said, I propose to call this magnitude S, the entropy of the system, after the Greek word for transformation, to be as similar as possible to the word energy. For the two magnitudes to be denoted by these words are so nearly allied in their physical meanings 
that a certain similarity in designation appears to be desirable. So, who among us today recognizes this physical meaning of entropy as Clausius intended? Probably not many of us. But our next guest might be able to help. Third chance. Let me introduce myself. My name is Calendar, Hugh Langborn Calendar. I'm a professor of physics at the Imperial College of Science, College of Science and Technologies in London. I began my experimental work in physics with J.J. Thompson. He encouraged me to develop a platinum resistance thermometer for high temperature measurements. And soon I could measure between minus 160 and 1,600 degrees Celsius. Revenue from my thermometer helped make me a wealthy man, but the thermometer itself enabled me to become a great scientist and engineer. I used this device to study steam, especially in engines. By 1915, I published my first edition of the calendar steam tables, which became famous. But I was not only interested in thermodynamics, I was also interested in how to teach thermodynamics. Yes, Professor. In 1911, 100 years ago this year, didn't you publish a paper about education of thermodynamics? Indeed, I did. I was president of the Physical Society of London and I wrote it for my presidential address. My intention was to re reintroduce the old idea of treating caloric as a fluid. Clausius gave it the name entropy and defined it as the integral of dq over t. Such a definition appeals to the mathematician only. In justice to Carnot, it should be called caloric. Even the mathematician would gain by thinking of caloric as a fluid, like electricity, capable of being generated by friction or other irreversible processes. Well, that sounds controversial. Using cal cal caloric instead of entropy is really just a convenient method of expression. I don't see how there could be serious objections to adopting it. Okay, well, can you tell us the main idea of your suggestion? Uh, we have become so saturated with the idea that heat is energy, that we forget that the quantity of heat is not completely specified by its energy equivalent. It is true that we can solve most questions in heat in terms of energy and temperature without explicit references to caloric or entropy. We could similarly solve most electrical problems without mentioning amperes, but Everything is greatly simplified and rendered more direct if we adopt caloric as the true measure of heat quantity and regard this processing energy in virtue of its temperature. Ah, okay, so that does make it clearer what Clausius meant about the relationship of energy and entropy. But Professor, I have to tell you, 100 years later your ideas remain almost unnoticed by the physics community. Oh. Do you know why? No, it's too bad. Perhaps this conception of caloric appears to run counter to some of our most cherished popular illusions with regard to heat. And it's true that it may be difficult to isolate a particular set of material particles and label them caloric. But the mathematical conception of entropy makes it all the more necessary for our sanity and progress to think and speak of it as a material fluid. Mm. Yes, okay, well thank you very much, Professor. Uh, I, we should note that in 1838, Calendar's son, Guy Stewart Calendar, published the first paper with experimental evidence of human-induced climate change, which is now called the Calendar Effect. As for entropy, the third chance was missed. So to wrap up, we can, oh wait, there's, looks like we have one more guest. Yeah, hello, if you've got fit fire. Um, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm Gottfried Falk, Professor of Didactics of Physics at the University of Karlsruhe in Germany. I was a professor of mathematical physics before that, but my work to make thermodynamics more axiomatic in the 1950s led me to the discover a useful approach to teaching physics. 
I've been developing that idea ever since, including a children's book with my colleague Friedrich Hermann. It was Hermann who told me of a 1972 book by Georg Jung, a physical chemist from the University of Hamburg, proposing to think the, of entropy the way we speak of heat in common language, such as the walls of a house prevent the heat from leaking out. The physicists will tell you that it is wrong to imagine that energy is contained in a system as heat. But if we take heat to mean entropy, as my friend Jörg suggests, <coughs> the common language becomes correct. And as represented in this picture, heat can flow and also be produced. Interesting. So have you published this idea? Yeah. In 1985, I wrote a paper arguing that Jörg's entropy is really just Carlos caloric and Black's quantity of heat under different names. Indeed, entropy can be visualized as a kind of substance which obeys half a conservation theory. It can be created, but not destroyed. That's actually very similar to the argument of Kalendar from 1911. Right. It's, a fun, it's funny, but Job and I had never heard about anything about Kalendar's work until a referee for my paper told me about it. I added a note in the proof. So Kalendar's ideas never became well known, let alone adopted. It's astonishing. Despite its unquestionable scientific merit, Kalendar's work has never been incorporated in textbooks on thermodynamics. Very interesting. Vielen Dank. <laughs> Exodus. So now there is actually a textbook that includes Kalendar's ideas. It's the Karlsruhe Physics course by Hermann and Jo, and it has been translated, parts of it, uh, into several languages, which you see on the bottom. And while Kalendar and Falk argue for a resurrection of caloric, the old caloric theory does have discredited aspects. It is not the heat atmosphere around each platinum, pla uh, excuse me, the heat atmosphere around each planet-like atom keeping them all separate, we now have protons and electrons in quantum theory for that. But caloric theory does give us a model for macroscopic entropy, which is a concept we don't currently have in physics education. Macroscopic entropy complements the statistical mechanical interpretation. In Boltzmann's prized equation for entropy, what he called the logarithm of a probability of a complexion is not a great introduction for most students. And so without a solid concept for entropy, it's difficult for scientists and engineers to understand where they are wasting energy. This is hugely important for solving our energy and climate problems, and uh, we know about those climate problems from Kalendar. <coughs> so on this 100th anniversary of Kalendar's paper, we have one more chance, and maybe the last one. Let us see if we can find a way to live with entropy. Thank you.